Grant, um, you grew up in Michigan. In, in fact, I, yeah, there's one other Michiganite right here. Okay, <laughs> good. And we put her at the front table. You see good, that? Good, good. So, Grant, you grew up in Michigan, uh, and your wife is here with you tonight. In fact, I want to ask Nikki Long if she will stand, please. She's right over here. Nikki. There she is. That one. Now, do I understand that you and Nikki were junior high sweethearts? You understand that correctly. And uh, on the heels of uh, congratulating the couples tonight that celebrated their uh, over 50 years of marriage together, Nikki and I just celebrated our 24th year of marriage uh, a couple days ago. So, uh, you know, it's, it's been a terrific ride. Uh, as I always tell her, I don't try to keep up with the numbers. I just know that, you know, we're married September 22nd, and as long as I remember that date, it doesn't really matter how many years we've been married. <laughs> Next year's Associates Dinner is going to be September 22nd, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> in honor of Grant and Nikki. Grant, I want to ask you, now, growing up, I've heard you speak before. I heard you speak at the Edmund Mayer's prayer breakfast a few years ago. Growing up, faith was a very important element in your family. Would you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think as, you know, when you think back to when you were younger, uh, I know for me that my grandma used to dra drag me to church. Um, and I say drag me, I mean really drag me. And then she would kind of barter with, it was, it was five of us. It was, I got four brothers, so it was five of us in our family, five boys. And in order for us to get up and go to church, it was one of those, you could smell the breakfast in her house when she was cooking, but it was one of those, okay, let's get up and eat. But there was a deal that had to be made. You don't eat unless you're going to church. So we, we kind of felt like we had to eat. We had to go to church if we were going to eat. But when we got to church, it was one of those things that, you know, we, we really weren't paying a whole lot of attention because we were kids. We were into everything that we could possibly get ourselves into, uh, waiting for the, the wine to come across. And we got some of that kind of stuff. It, it was just a whole lot of different things that we got ourselves into. I can remember the, the ladies and the elders of the church and would catch us sleeping in the church and give us one of these or give us that swift pinch on the arm. Uh, but a lot of times we were just there. But I fast forward to my first ever uh, uh, case of adversity, if you will. And even though I wasn't paying attention a whole lot, I was sleeping a whole lot, I understood that by being in the church, there was a foundation that was there. So when I hit that patch of adversity, that's the first place I went back to because I understood, okay, I was there. And even though I was forced or almost forcing myself to be there, there was still something getting on the inside of me that told me when I had, had that patch of adversity, that's the place I needed to go to. I had to have that relationship with the Father. Wow, that's great. So you were a high school basketball star. You uh, go to Eastern Michigan University. You play there four years. Tell me about your college experience. Is it what you expected? I got more than I expected by, by leaps and bounds. Um, I was recruited heavily you know, throughout the country. I ended up staying at home. I grew up about 20 minutes from Eastern Michigan University. And I, I can say it now because she's my wife of 24 years. She was a big part of why I stayed home. Uh, if, if you're young kids now and you're thinking about, I'm going to stay home because of my boyfriend or girlfriend, I probably wouldn't give you that advice, but it worked out for me. Uh, you know, so I, I, I'm, very, I'm very happy about it. But, uh, when, it, when it came down to choosing a college, I, I was a guy that uh, one of the first people in my family to go to college. So I wanted a place that would offer, I mean, all the adventures that a college campus could, uh, could provide. And I wanted, there, there was a, a school in Detroit that was basically in a downtown area, didn't have a campus. They had all the school rooms and this and this and this and this. It was a pretty good school, but it didn't have a campus. I took one trip to Eastern Michigan and I saw the, the students out some of them were playing Frisbee, some of them were in the library, some of them were doing this, and it, just, it was just a sprawling campus, and I said, this is the place for me. Mm. You know, it was a, a great mix of people. They, were, they treated me very nicely there. I mean, just walking through the campus, nobody knew who I was, but everybody was friendly. Hey, how you doing today? Are, are you taking classes here? And I felt like that was an environment that I could grow in and that I wanted to be in, and I made my choice to go to Eastern Michigan based on the fact that, again, that it was a a great learning environment, um, multicultural people. It was, it, it was just a wonderful opportunity to get my education. Oh, that's great. Okay, so at the end of your college career, 1988, you're graduating and you are drafted in the NBA draft. You're drafted in the second round by an expansion team. He's drafted, ladies and gentlemen, by the Miami Heat. Their success today 
is based on the foundation that Grant Long provided them back in the late 80s and, and early 90s. Now, your NBA career spanned 15 seasons, about 1,000 games, about 10,000 points scored. You played for Miami, you played for Atlanta, you played for Vancouver, you played for Memphis, you played for Boston, you played for Detroit. Yep. Um, tell us about, do you have any particular highlights that you remember during your, your NBA career that really stick out as vivid memory points for you? I think for me growing up in Michigan, first of all, if you ever grew up in Michigan, you know Magic Johnson is from, uh, is from Michigan. So the Lakers were my favorite team uh, growing up as a high school player and even a college player. I had every Magic Johnson poster you could possibly imagine on my wall. I don't think you could even see any paint on my wall because they were all covered with Magic Johnson posters, floor to ceiling. It was just Magic Johnson everything. So uh, he was the guy that I followed. He was the guy that I emulated a lot. and. Although our games are completely different, nobody would ever recognize that he was the guy that I followed because our games are completely different. But what I tell people is that the thing that I admire most about Magic Johnson is that he had control, complete control of the game when he took the floor. And that's what I wanted to try to do as a player, take control of the game with whatever ability that I had. And so fast forward to the NBA and to get the opportunity to play against Magic Johnson. That was, that was my moment that I said, wow, I'm lining up for the tip, and I've got Magic Johnson here, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar on one side, James Worthy on the other side, and I'm thinking, wow, this guy is on my wall at home right now, <laughs> and I'm playing against him. You know, my, my eyes just lit up, and I can remember the first quarter where I didn't even want to foul the guy, I didn't want to touch him, I didn't want to, I didn't, I mean, didn't want to push him down or anything, and, he's, and we're down by that time, our, our short story, we lost our first 17 games in a row in my first season, pretty much the laughing stock of the NBA with the Miami Heat, but, uh, so we're getting our butt kicks in the first quarter, and I'm guarding this guy, and I'm like, I don't want to touch him, I don't want to foul him, I don't want to do anything, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar by the end of the first quarter is sitting down because they're up by so much, so, the coach kind of gets on us. You guys are starstruck, you know, with the Los Angeles Lakers. He has no idea that Magic Johnson is my favorite player. But I recognized then that what made what makes him so great is his ability to compete hmm. night in and night out. And that's when I told myself, you know, never mind who he is, never mind the posters that are on your wall. You've got to go out and compete to the highest level if you want to be great like he is. Hmm. And that that switch turned on for me. That you know, all, and all of a sudden he's not my hero on the wall. He's just a guy that I'm playing against. And after that, a remarkable story that we've become friends, I mean, great friends over the years, and I still consider him a true friend now. Oh, that's great. Well, so I'll, I want to ask you, as a man of faith, your 15 years in the NBA, were, was it difficult to be a man of faith while you were playing in the NBA? I think there are challenges for, for everybody. I think you have to be so well grounded when you take on being a professional athlete, or I think anytime you take the ascension to rise in your field, there are things, there are powers that are, are set to go against you. As they say, you're beset on all sides with distractions. Uh, I've always lived by this. People should know who you are and what you stand for. And a lot of times that will keep a lot of those things out of the way. For example, the fact that I tell people that I'm a Christian, when I, when I, wherever I'm done speaking, when I tell people, I, when I had my number retired at Eastern Michigan University, after talking for about 15 or 20 minutes, and I said, I don't want you to leave here and tell people, hey, I saw Grant Long tonight, uh, he did this for Eastern Michigan, he did this, and I said, I want the, the most important thing I want you to tell people when you leave here tonight is that I saw Grant Long, and you know what, he's a Christian. That's what I want you to leave this arena telling people. So when, when you have a faith that you wear on the outside, so to speak, you wear it on the outside, a lot of those things don't come your way. A lot of us don't even understand how protected we are because people understand who we are. So for instance, you're not going to come, people are not going to come to me and say, hey, let's get Grant to go to a nightclub because they know I'm not doing that because they know who I am and what I stand for. And I've always tried to make that light shine very bright as a hedge around me so those things don't come in my wheelhouse. So you kind of associate with yourself with 
like-minded people. And there are people in the NBA and NFL and all other major sports that follow Christ. And you try to follow those guys and you get grouped with those people because you understand they are kind of your hedge as well. They're going to protect you from those things as well. So you try to stay with those like-minded people. But again, I think the biggest point, the biggest thing that I stress, and even to young kids, that, they, that people should know who you are and what you stand for. Jesus Christ asked the question, who do men say I am? Well, if he wanted to know who they say he is, I, certainly we should understand that and want to know who people think we are. And they should know who we are and what we stand for. And again, you keep a lot of those things from coming in your wheelhouse when your light is shining so bright that it doesn't even come in your direction. What a great answer that is, huh? Wow. Wow, that's really special. Well, so, so as, you, as you created that hedge and you knew, you made sure that people knew what kind of a man you were, did you find other followers of Jesus that were coaches or players in the NBA? Well, you find a lot of them. You find a lot of the coaches that uh, it, it, sometimes the NBA will separate. And if you've ever, I'm sure everybody here has watched a lot of professional sports. But it's ironic and it's odd to me. And Mark Jackson is one of the guys, one of the coaches. I played against Mark Jackson. He's the head coach of the Golden State Warriors. It's a guy that wears his Christianity on his sleeve. He wears it on his hat. He wears it anywhere you could possibly wear it. He, he, he'll, he will tell you, if you've got five minutes to listen, he'll tell you that he's a follower of Christ. And I love that about him. And one of the games that they won, he was on a national interview and he said, well, they asked, well, you know, what happened? What, what was the responsible for this great play and so forth and so forth? And he went on to say, you know what? You're probably going to cut me off right now, but I'm going to give all the, all the credit and glory to Christ. And when you start to talk like that, it's, it's, it's amazing how the camera moves somewhere else. Mm. We don't want to spread that kind of word. This is a sporting event. We don't, this is this man professing that, you know what? I couldn't have done this without Christ. And this is all he's doing is giving Christ the glory in this biggest moment. I want people to know it wasn't me, it was Christ. So you find those people throughout the league, but it's just, again, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's mandated, but you understand that the person probably on the other side of that camera is probably not a follower because he would keep it focused on that gentleman who is tell, telling the audience, Christ did it, not me. I would think the other guy on the side of that camera would be saying, keep it on this guy, he's telling you the truth. But that doesn't happen. So you still have to find your way and navigate your way to those special people uh, again, and, and group yourself with those people. And I, I think as a unit, as, as, a, as a group, you're able to, to spread the word and lead by example. Uh, and, and that's the way you should. You live that, that kind of life and people are going to follow. Just as that you have followers that follow you when you do the wrong things, you, you'll have a group of people that will follow you that way as well. But you have to consistently. And I, I, I got to tell people, sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time, being a Christian can be some of your toughest work, but it also yields the biggest reward. But being a Christian, you think about this every day, and one of my biggest things that I do is I speak to men. One of the biggest things for a man daily, he's challenged every single day from the time he gets his head up off the pillow, he's making a decision, not for just himself, for his entire family. He's making some decisions. From the time he gets his head off the pillow and puts his feet on the floor, decisions have to be made that's going to affect him and possibly the rest of his family. So when I tell you that it's, it's tough being a Christian, it's also very difficult being a man as well, but I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I don't wanna be a woman, I'm gonna tell you that right now. I do not wanna be a woman. I envy my wife, I love her to death, but I don't wanna be her. I love being a man. <laughs> Just for the record, I'm just letting you know. And, and I'm not gonna ask any follow-up questions on that. Um, <laughs> Hey, you know, you do a great job as a TV analyst, and, and you know, you, boy, you work closely with, uh, with our Thunder. And by the way, I, I think you could get out on the court today with our Thunder and compete pretty well. Uh, I mean, I, I, I get that sense very well. Tell us, though, what are our Thunder players like? We think we know what they're like, and we love them. Uh, and it seems like they love Oklahoma as well. They seem like fine, fine men. Well, they are. And I think we have to start with the organization first. And I think when you, you understand what this organization is all about, we have a mantra that we say, we don't just play here, we live here. Mm -hmm. So in order, the fact that we live here, we want to see our communities that we live in, we want to see them thrive. We want to see them do better. We want to see them be a part of the rest of the city. So uh, when, you, when you say 
these guys look like they like Oklahoma? Well, they generally do because this is where they live. This is where, not only where they work, this is where they live. They have families here. They have their children here, a lot of them. And they are a young bunch of guys at the end of the day. I mean, these guys are sitting on the airplane and they're playing with their Nintendos and this and this and this. And I say, you guys are professional athletes and you're playing Game Boys and all this other kind of stuff, really? But, but it just goes to show you how young they are. Uh, young at heart as well, uh, but I, I think they've embraced the city much as much as the city has embraced them in all of their charity work that they do. Just to throw out a random stat, I, I think the Oklahoma City Thunder, the the call mandated by the NBA is to do at least 75 to 100 charity events, uh, be involved in the community during charity at least 100 of those per year. And the Thunder, I believe, for the third year in a row has been way over 100 beyond the call of duty because that's just what this organization stands for. They want to not just be here and take away, take away, take away, but you want to be a lasting uh, impression in your city, in your state, that uh, this, is, this is an organization that is a refuge for this city as well. And there's so many great things have happened since this team has come here. Mm -hmm. And you go back to the players, and again, the, the kind of players that – you put, if you're Sam Preston, you, you do your background checks and you go get players that are not only, not only just good skilled on the basketball floor, but people that are going to make an impact in your community because you're only gonna play basketball for two hours at Chesapeake Energy Arena. The rest of that time, you're gonna be out into the community. So what kind of person are you going to be away from that arena is what concerns Sam Preston and the organization. Hmm. So the season's about to begin. Uh, would you make a prediction? Do we need to go ahead and reserve tickets for the finals? Uh. That would be something, I gotta tell you. Uh, I, I called a game, I called our game when we went to the finals, obviously, and uh, I told my wife this, I was a kid from Romulus, Michigan, where I'm from, played basketball, but if you'd have told me seventh grade, eighth grade, where I met my wife, obviously, and uh, Nikki in the seventh grade, uh, if you'd have told me then that I'd be calling an NBA game in the finals, you could have knocked me over with a cotton ball. I just, it, it's, it's such a thrill, really, to be in that, you know, it's a great seat every night, first of all. I'm calling Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook's games every single night. What a thrill that is for me to be up close and personal with these guys and watching a guy transform right before my eyes in Kevin Durant, who's led the NBA, and I don't know, in scoring three or four years. He's, in my estimation, a future Hall of Famer, along with Russell Westbrook. To be able to say I saw these guys when they were, I mean, pups pretty much, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous thrill. Hmm. Grant, I, I love to introduce you as a great former basketball player, love to introduce you as a TV analyst, love to introduce you as my friend, but maybe the best title that I think you wear is you're the father of a freshman at Oklahoma Christian University. <laughs> um, Abigail, can I get Abigail to stand up? Yeah, Abigail Long, right here, freshman at OC. And, and in fact, Abigail, st keep standing. I want all of our students from Oklahoma Christian to please stand. Would all of you all stand who are students at OC? Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's not too late for you to enroll at Oklahoma Christian <laughs> University. One last question, Grant. Um, you and Nikki allowed Abigail to come to Oklahoma Christian. T tell us why that was okay with you. Well, I think it was a matter, I saw it in the highlight before we got going here, that the brotherhood, the sisterhood, uh, from the very first, from the initial contact of the faculty and staff with Abigail, it was always a, how can we help you? I got a sense that when I sent her to school here, it was like sending her to my mom's house or sending her to her grandmother's house. She was going to be well taken care of. Now, high expectations are there, but expectations don't get met unless there's support. And I know the support is here for her to succeed. And that's what really drove me here to say, you know what, this is a great place because it's so personal. They're going to give her that pat on the back when she needs it, but they're also going to tell her, listen, you need to buckle down and get going. And for young kids in their first year of college, I've been there obviously, if you get behind early, it could be, it could be a whirlwind the rest of the way. So to know that she was coming here, that people were going to genuinely care about her. You know, yeah, she's a student here, she's going to school here, but 
caring about her as an individual to make sure that she's going to stay on task, that her well-being, she's going to grow socially, she's going to grow spiritually. Those things are important to me because not only do you make uh, a, a productive citizen for society, but you also create somebody that could that will potentially go out and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ because of where they've been, because of what they, the knowledge that they have for going to a university like this. So it, it's so many different things that could happen when you graduate from this university, and all positive, if you ask me. And I think that those are the biggest reasons, again, the, the big time support that we felt like we received from the initial contact. You know, it was no question that the support was going to be there from every member of the faculty that we touched and had interaction with. They gave us the idea and gave us a sense that leave her here, drop her off and go. She's going to be fine. And again, it's like dropping her off at grandma's house every time. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Grant Long. Thank you very much.